Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. We've got an exciting presentation lined up for you today with uh, Lena talking about the 101 of introduction to mainframe hardware. So maybe we'll just give another 30 seconds or so for more people to join, and then we'll get started. And um, just want to say, you'll all be on mute uh, throughout the session. But if you do have a question, please put it in the chat. And then um, I will monitor that and make sure we get that question to Lena. OK, can I start? <laughs> I think we're at the beginning. Yeah, right, please go well, ahead. Lina. Thank you very much, Atul. So um, hi, everyone. My name is Lena Rush. I'm a technical specialist at IBM and I focus on mainframe hardware. So um, I joined IBM almost three years ago, and yeah, I'm very excited to give you a bit of an introduction to mainframe hardware. So, um, you know, the aim of the session is really to give you a basic understanding of what a mainframe is and what makes the mainframe hardware design so special. And I also wanna talk a bit about some cool use cases on how we can use the platform. So let's start with defining what a mainframe is. So a mainframe is a computer used by organizations for critical applications that require high levels of security, reliability, availability, and serviceability. So it's a computer like your uh, laptop or your phone is a computer, but the architecture of the mainframe is specifically designed to be a great fit for critical applications that really require high availability and security. We also usually wouldn't call a mainframe just computer, but we refer to it more as an, a server and enterprise server. Um, so now in the first part of the session, we will explore why the mainframe architecture is such a good fit for those type of applications. Before I go into more detail on that, I just wanna um, give you a bit of background on the different types of servers and how the mainframe would fit into that. So, um, one of the most commonly used server um, is following the x86 architecture. So those are rack servers. Um, and as you can see it in, in the image here, um, you know, they would come in like huge, huge server farms often, and you would have those um, rack servers into, in, in drawers and, and those sort of frames. Um, then here on the right, we have a mainframe um, and it comes in configured frames. So we will talk a bit more about that later, how, you know, how it is configured and the different sizes of it. Um, but often mainframes are actually able to do the work of um, tens or even hundreds of those x86 rack servers. And that's one of the key strengths of the platform that's very powerful. Um, so for certain workloads, it really makes sense to use mainframes instead of x86 servers, because you might be able to run more efficiently or you require really high security or uptime. And we talk about why it's such a good fit um, throughout the session. So um, I want to quickly talk about um, who is actually using mainframes. And um, we know that banks are using mainframes and a lot of institutions, but most of us use mainframes every day. We get in touch with them every day, but we don't know about it or we don't think about it. So if we get cash at a cash point, or if we pay anything with our credit cards, um, if we make an insurance claim, or if we go grocery shopping, at all of those things, we actually get in touch with a mainframe. So every day, over 30 billion business transactions are running on set, so on mainframes. And just to put that in comparison, there are around 5.6 billion Google searches per day. And we know there are a lot of Google searches per day, but there are even more transactions running on mainframes. So um, it's a very, very relevant platform and a lot is, a lot is still going on in its space. So um, here are just some stats on, you know, what sort of companies are actually using mainframes. So most of the top banks are using mainframes, most of the insurance companies, a lot of the retailers and a lot of the airlines. So, um, you know, what sort of applications are we using mainframes for? And that's really the critical applications. So um, critical applications can be things like financial 
transactions, airline control systems, production and inventory control or um, payroll. So those are applications which always need to be available and that deal with very sensitive data. So, you know, we need to keep them very secure. So the type of transactions that are actually running on mainframes can be divided in two, two different buckets. So there are the real-time transactions. So that's stuff which um, is event-based and it needs to happen right in that moment so for example credit card payments or making a purchase so it really needs to happen instantly and then we also have batch processing so that's the stuff which kind of gets summarized um you know summarized what happened during a certain time of period for example paychecks or phone bills um and the mainframe is really excelling at doing both of those types of transactions and just to um give you a bit more of an example what it actually means here um it's like a, a bit of a banking use case um how the mainframe would pay play a role in, in that sort of use case um so for example if you want to get cash from a cash point um the request would be sent over to the mainframe the mainframe would then read the data from storage to see if the request can be accepted and it will then update the balance in the database, communicate it back to me, and I would get the cash and I would see the new balance. And that will be a real time transaction because it needs to happen in that moment. But when we, for example, um, have a user from HR in the, in the central office who's doing payroll, that doesn't need to happen in that moment, but it can be scheduled to happen, happen during the night. And the reason why you would maybe do that as night, at night is to optimize the utilization. So it's similar to um, your laptop, maybe if you open all of your applications and you do loads of stuff, stuff, it will slow down or it might even crash and you really want to avoid that. So you want to optimize your utilization and you need to schedule your tasks in a smart way. So, you know, during the day, your mainframe might already be quite busy with serving all of the real time transactions, but then at night, usually those would not happen that much. So you could do your batch processing. So, um, now I want to quickly talk about how an organization can actually use mainframes. So if they have their own data center, it can be part of the, maybe their own private cloud, or it can be part of a hybrid cloud. So if a company would be maybe having some stuff on premise, some stuff in a public cloud, the mainframe can really integrate into that hybrid, hybrid cloud strategy of a company. Um, but mainframes can also be used in the public cloud. So here is um, a screenshot of how you can use mainframes in the IBM public cloud. So those um, are packaged there as the hyper protect services, which offer some extra security on top, but you can also just um, create um, a basic virtual server instance on a mainframe in the IBM cloud. And that's really an, a very easy way for you to just, you know, get, get your hands on a mainframe. But those are kind of the different models how mainframes can be used so it's not just if you think oh on premise i'm very restricted and how i can use it no it's really like very open and very you know it can be integrated in all sorts of different ways so um i can't keep on saying the mainframe but um there's not the one mainframe mainframes have really evolved a lot over the time and they have a lot of heritage um but what they all have in common is that they adhere to the same mainframe architecture. But of course, over the, the years, they have changed massively. Um, just, you know, like our laptops are very different from how they were 10 years ago. So let's take a look at the evolution of the mainframe. So the first system which can be considered a mainframe is the System 360, which was introduced in April 1964. And at that point, computers were still dedicated to certain tasks. So you would most likely have a computer dedicated to your commercial tasks and a computer dedicated to uh, maybe a scientific task. Um, but the System 360 was really the first computer which was able to handle various types of applications. And that's why it's called 360. And at that point, IBM made the promise of the promise of backwards compatibility. And this means that any application which is written on a System 360 is able to run on future versions of the mainframe architecture. 
And that was really important back then because um, companies spend a lot of effort on developing applications and software. And then what often happened was that a new sort of model came out, a new version, and they had to redo everything because it wasn't compatible anymore. And by having a mainframe, IBM committed to the backward compatibility and they were able to resolve the issues for the companies. So they could rely on their development efforts actually paying out also for, you know, for future models. And that was quite popular um, because it was really a game changer in, in, in the space back then. And that's actually still true today, um, the backwards compatibility fact. So then in the 1970s, we had the system 370 that was released. And um, one special concept which, which came with that model was the concept of virtual memory. Then um, in the 90s, the system 390. And then in 2000, the set architecture was introduced. And you might notice right away the change of naming convention. So the set stands for zero downtime. Um, and from 2000 onwards, we also started supporting Linux on the system. So up to then, you um, mainly had the, you know, it's called nowadays it's called set OS, like the specific mainframe operating system. But from that point on, you could also just use like your mainframe to run your normal Linux workload. And um, there are quite big gaps between those releases, but um, there were loads of other generations coming out um, in between those different, you know, bigger, bigger model changes. So um, we now support Linux for over 20 years already. And um, we actually even brought out a system which is fully dedicated to Linux workloads. So that's called the Linux One. It um, also follows the mainframe architecture. And from a hardware perspective, it's similar to the set machine. Um, but yeah, you can only run Linux on it and um, no set OS and no other operating system. So um, nowadays we usually every two years or every three years, we have a new system coming out. Um, so the set 15 or the Linux one three the latest versions came out in 2019, but um, the next version will most likely come out next year. Okay, so now I wanna dive deeper into the latest model and into the actual mainframe architecture. So a mainframe is made up out of CPC TROS that stands for Central Processing Complex. And this really kind of houses the brain of the mainframe. Then we have IO TROS and power cooling and cabling. But, um, you know, mainframes, have a lot of power and they can, you know, they can house up to 190 cores, but not every company needs that much, you know, that much power in, in one single server. So um, whoever buys a mainframe can decide on how powerful they need their machine to be so they can really configure it to their needs. And in the table, we can see a bit how this would work. So based on the number of cores you need, um, you would only need a certain number of CP CPC trials um, to kind of fit that need, of course. Um, so if you would have a maximum configuration of 190 cores, you'd require five trials, but then you know you can always have a smaller version and then you might only need um, one CPC trial. So based on that configuration, the mainframe comes in different sizes and we can see that here. So based on, you know, on how many cores you need, how many drawers you need, you can have up to four frames from as little as one frame. And today the mainframe sizing follows the standard data center design. So it's really standardized hardware design, making one frame 19 inch wide. Um, so we don't have to stand out, mainframes fit in into the data center, just like all the other racks do. Um, and we can stand with storage, we can stand with the x86 servers. And that actually was a quite um, a special thing which changed with that latest generation that came out in 2019. Because before that, mainframes had um, a different form factor. They weren't 19 inch, they were a bit bigger. And um, they often had their own area in a data center. And um, from, you know, from what we heard, customers really would prefer it actually just being a standard sizing. So this was a change that was made to make it, you know, 
less less different you know to make it a bit more more the same as, as the other servers okay so um now let's dive a bit deeper into what is actually inside of a mainframe so here we have a maximum configured set 15 from the inside um so even if you might work with an older model the key components are the same so let's start with taking a look at the naming convention so the first frame you would get is the a frame so this frame so if you have a small configuration and you only require one frame then you would only get that a that a frame um, if you need two frames you would get the a and the b frame and so on if you have the maximum configuration you get a b c and z um, then um, the maximum configuration here for the maximum configuration we would have five cpc draws and they would all be distributed across the A and the B frame. Then we would have 12 IO draws, which are split up over all of the frames. Um, and then we also have um, the support element, which is at the top, and then the power and cooling at the bottom. Okay, and now I wanna go through all of those components in a bit more detail. And um, now we can start with the support element. So mainframes are extremely high performing machines, but you know, how do we actually operate them? So for that, we have the support element and the support element integrates two servers itself. So you have a workstation to monitor and to operate the system and it's a closed system. So you cannot just go there and plug something in, but you can only do what it is designed to do. So but it would, you know, it would be a bit difficult if every time you want to do something with the mainframe and want to do a change, you actually have to physically go into your data center and you have to physically like be at that machine and work with the support element. So um, that will be really inefficient. And that's why we have the hardware management console, the HMC. And the hardware management console lets you access the support element functions remotely. So you can add multiple mainframes to a single HMC and you can add a single mainframe to multiple HMCs. Now let's also take a look at the power and cooling. So there for the set 15, we have two options. One is the IPDU and the other one is called bulk power. And you know it just depends on one the organization's requirements, which power option is chosen there. Um, and the power requirements also depend on how many CPC draws you have and how many IO draws are chosen. Um, then you also have two options for the cooling, air or water, and that also just depends on the organization's preferences for that. Okay, then now let's take a look inside the CPC draw. So um, we can have up to five CPC draws in a maximum configured set 15. And in each CPC drawer, we can have four single chip modules, which are abbreviated to SCM. And on those SCMs, we have the cores. And there can be 12 cores per single chip module. And those are really the brain of the mainframe. That's where all the work is happening. Then we have one system controller chip, which is responsible for the communication between the single chip modules. Then we have the PCIe fanout slots, which are the draw connections. So how you connect actually the CPC draw to the other stuff in the mainframe. Um, and also for communicating between the different draws and communicating with IO. Then, and then we also have the memory. So we have a maximum of eight terabytes of memory per drawer. And then we also have the cooling manifold. Okay, so um, now let's, look um, a bit more into detail into the single chip modules. So um, here is the current processor which we have for the Z15. So it's built with a 14 nanometer um, technology and there are nine to 12 cores active per chip. It runs at 5.2 gigahertz. Um, but if clients want to, they can subcap the speed so they can actually run it at a lower speed um, and that might be because they want to take you know they 
they want to take advantage of lower license licensing costs and so on so that would be an option to run it at lower speed actually um there are 9.2 billion transistors built in onto one single chip um and each core has its private level one and level two cache um and then there's also the level three cache which is for the communication between um, the cores, the memory, the I.O., and the system controller chip, which we saw on the previous slide. So um, one thing that was newly released with the Z15 is the on-chip compression. So before that, um, we had compression cards, and those would go into the I.O. tour, but they then brought it on the chip level to make it more efficient and to make it faster. So um, that combined with the on-chip cryptography, which was released with that previous, the previous model, so the set 14, um, really made the concept of encryption very feasible for organizations. So um, we can really do pervasive encryption with very little overhead because it all happens at the chip level. Um, so you are able to first compress the data and then you can encrypt that compressed data so you have less to encrypt and with that you can make it really efficient and here i also want to um, quickly touch on some exciting stuff which is happening in the mainframe world so um, a new processor chip which will be released next year that is called the telem processor so um, you know mainframes traditionally hold a lot of the sensitive and critical data and um, if you want to do any sort of analytics and AI on that sort of critical sensitive data, it's very, you know, it's difficult because usually you don't want to move that sort of data around. So um, what we now do with that new Telum chip is actually we implemented an AI accelerator on the chip. Um, so that's just, you know, it's similar to um, the the crypto accelerator and the compression accelerator, which were added with previous generations. We now also have the AI accelerator. And with that, you can really do the analytics on chip level. Um, and that combined with you know, the crypto accelerator and the compression accelerators really makes it possible to run any sort of AI inference task directly on the mainframe without having to move the data around. And you can really make it efficient while while keeping the data sec secure. Um, okay, now um, I want to talk a bit about logical processors because the mainframe processors can behave in a couple of different ways, depending on how we configure them. So from a physical perspective, all of those processors which are in the system are exactly the same. But from a logical perspective, they are different. Um, so they can behave like the processors which you have in your laptop, and those are called the CP processors, so the central processors, and those processors can do all kinds of workload. Then we also have the IFL processors, which is um, the integrated facility for Linux, and those IFL processors are, spe are specifically there for running Linux workload on the mainframe, so you can only run Linux on IFL. Then um, we also have the SIP processors, um, and you can offload certain workloads on those processors, for example, Java or DB2 workloads. And it's the same concept with, like the IFLs. So, you know, it might be more cost efficient to run stuff like Linux on IFLs or DB2 on SIPs instead of um, running them on, on CP processors. So it's really more from a cost perspective. Um, that that a company would decide to get IFL processors instead of only having CP processors. Um, then we also have the ICF processors, which are the internal coupling facility. And those are necessary if you want to have a high availability configuration for your mainframe. So if you want to cluster different mainframes together. And I will also talk about the coupling a bit later. So. Um, those four logical processes are configured are configurable by the client. So in my role at IBM, I work with clients and they tell me, oh, I want to have four central processors. I want to have eight IFLs because I maybe have a lot of 
Linux workload and I would have a tool where I can configure them and then it gets loaded on the machine. So that's really from a logical perspective only. So um, besides the four type of processes that the client can configure, um, we also have two different types of logical processes which are required by the system. So we have the SAP processor, the system assist processor, and that helps to link between the CPs and the IO. And then um, we have the IFP, the integrated firmware processor, um, and that really is for system operations and management. Okay, now um, we have seen, you know, kind of how what components make up the mainframe and the mainframe can really get very big and quite complex because we have a lot of cores and in the same physical machine so it has a lot of processes a lot of memory a lot of io so how do we actually manage that and how do you, do we make it run efficiently and that's where um, the concept of virtualization comes in so virtualization means that we take bits of the physical resources and build a separate system with them. So those separate systems are called LPARs. So that's short for logical partitions. So those logical partitions actually are completely separate, even though they are on the same physical system. So um, you can decide what sort of operating system you wanna have on your LPAR. You can also decide how many resources it gets, but you can also share resources across the LPARs or dedicate them, you know, whatever, whatever you prefer. Um, and, you know, you can special, you can specify how you want um, the virtualization to be in your system and you can set it up when you set up your machine or you can change it um, afterwards as well. Um, you know, to manage all of those LPARs and to manage all of those resources, we need a hypervisor. And we have here the type one hypervisor that actually manages the real physical resources and it's called PRISM, so P-R-S-M. And PRISM divides the real computing into the logical computing um, for the LPARs. So it's implemented in the firmware at the very base system. And PRISM fully virtualizes all the system resources and it runs without any additional software. And through Prism, you can create up to 85 LPARs on one, one physical mainframe. So basically, this, those would be really like 85 separate servers on, on the big mainframe server. And um, yeah, you can run a mix of ZOS, ZVM, Linux, or also KVM. And it's all isolated and secured. So then we also have the type two hypervisor, which comes on top of Prism. Um, and that's where you, how you can actually virtualize further because you might need um, more, more sort of environments than only 85 LPARs because you might wanna have separate environments for your DevOps, you, you, know, you wanna test that one operating system, but you don't wanna, or you wanna test that one application, but you don't you wanna have it isolated. You, you don't want it to take over a different sort of LPAR. So that's how you would virtualize even further with the type two hypervisor. So we have ZVM and that's the IBM set proprietary server virtualization. And that's completely integrated into the full stack. Um, and then we also have KVM. So KVM is an open source choice. Um, it's for IBM set virtualization for Linux workloads. Um, and it's best for if you want to run Linux on set. So then you would maybe use KVM. Okay, so now let's take a look at the IO drawers. So um, here is a picture of the PCIe IO drawer. It has 16 slots, and this is where all of the input and output devices live. So um, you would have, for example, your crypto cards. So those are hardware security modules, and those would be cards that plug into your IO drawers. But you also would have all of your communication, for example, via FICON to storage or um, you know, communication between the different IO drawers. And that would all go through, through this um, IO drawer here. So this is really your connection to the outside world. 
Okay, now um, let's look at input and output operations and the IO subsystem in a bit more detail. So, um, you know, data which is stored on disks or tape, it somehow has to be transported into memory before the processing, into the mainframe actually. And after processing, this data also need to, needs to continue to go to its destination. And this movement is an I.O. operation. Um, and in the mainframe, there is an I.O. subsystem, the input-output subsystem. And the purpose of that I.O. subsystem is to relieve the processors of the tasks of communicating directly with the I.O. devices. And for that, we have the system assist processors, which you have seen on one of the previous slides. So those SAP processors handle all of the, you know, all of the, those sort of IO operations. Um, and through that, they free up the other processors so that the CP processors, the IFLs, and the SIPs really can focus on the actual um, work which they, they are supposed to do. Um, and this is really one of the key differences of the mainframe architecture to other architectures. So um, you can kind of imagine it like a highway with, with different lanes. Because we have those um, SAP processors, um, and they are dedicated to this I.O. workload, um, we create a lot of lanes and a highway. So you know, even if a lot of traffic is coming through, it doesn't get stuck because there is enough room for for it all to get through and that's why we why we offload them to the sap processors and why we kind of like they can deal with it and then we can have the other processors really doing the actual computational work okay so i mentioned earlier that set stands for zero downtime um and you know organizations really use mainframes for cr critical applications and that's where the concept of RAS comes in. So reliability, availability, and serviceability. So these are really the, the key premises which the mainframe design is following. So um, there are a few factors which contribute to RAS. So for example, how reliable is my hardware itself? Is it prone to, to human error? Um, how available is my system? And you know what happens actually in a case of a disaster? And, you know, what if, if the worst case scenario happens and there is an outage, like how, how long does it take me to actually detect it? How easily can I move my workload? Can I make online changes? And all of that is really important to consider. And that's what is considered throughout the entire, um, you know, design of the mainframe. So um, let's have a look at, you know, how the mainframe system design is actually supporting that. So um, every component within the mainframe has a decade long mean time between failures. So they've all been tested for a really long time and they only get approved um, you know, once they kind of check all the boxes and once we know that um, the component itself is really um, resilient. Um, but then also you have the concept of redundancy, even though we know that you know, the one component is really resilient. We cannot just rely on that. We have to avoid any sort of single point of failures. So we have to put another one of the same component in there. So just for redundancy purposes, to you know, worst case scenario, one component fails, we need to have a backup in there. Um, we need to um, really make sure there are no single point of failures and that we actually have a hot swap capability where if, you know, if something happens, worst case, can we, you know, quickly take over with a different mainframe or a different system? And, um, you know, how, how, can you, how can you add more capabilities and how can you even enhance it? And how can you make sure that the integrity of the system, you know, stays ensured even if you add different comp components? Those are all things which are really important to um, that claim of reliability, availability and serviceability, which you know, it's very important for the mainframe and um, really very thought through throughout the entire design process. Okay, so um, now I wanna quickly look into more detail into the concept of redundancy within the mainframe. So here we can see the set 15 from the inside again. 
And here are just a couple of examples for redundancy. So we have redundant power supplies and we have redundant cabling. Then um, you know, we have redundant, redundant support servers as, as we went through earlier, where we said we have two um, support element servers. We have um, redundant cooling and you know, it's all built into the heart of the, of the machine. Um, and also with the course and the actual CPC tour, they can take over from another if there is a failure. But um, that's all good. But what, what happens if there is actually like a natural disaster or if your entire data center goes down? Then you know you have redundancy within your machine, but it won't help you much because the um, entire machine is down. So um, that's why you always need to have a disaster recovery site or some sort of disaster recovery plan in place if you need a system which is always available. And that's um, where the concept of clustering and parallel sysplex comes in. We actually have a dedicated session on parallel sysplex in the 101 stream later on this week, I think, or next week. So I can really recommend it because I think that's a quite, um, quite fascinating concept and really important to understand. So with the mainframes, you're able to create a cluster, so a cluster of mainframes to really achieve the highest availability for your applications. And that is called a sysplex. So a sysplex is an active, active cluster of service. So basically it's a group of ZOS operating systems which work together and they are able to jointly use hardware and software and all the components to um, achieve a high availability workload processing environment. So you can create a sysplex within one data center um, but you can also connect systems in separate data centers. And that's really where the strength comes in just for, you know, if, if there is really a natural disaster and your entire data center would go down. And that's where um, the concept of geographically dispersed parallel sysplex or GDPS comes in. So you essentially have one entity that is running the work and that's the sysplex. Um, and even though you know that you've got multiple physical mainframes and you know within those multiple physical mainframes you have different logical LPAR, you know, like um, people or organizations often refer to, you know, the whole thing just collectively as the sysplex. Um, and here in this configuration, instead of needing every system being connected to every other system, we um, bring in that concept of a coupling facility. So the coupling facility is a special type of LPAR which you bring up and, and typically you will have backups of it on other mainframes as well. And the coupling facility really handles all of those complexities and overhead of all of the systems working together in the sysplex. And it ensures the communication of all the members in the sysplex and the main benefit of this um, capability is that you can remove any single points of failure of one server, of one LPAR, of, or of a subsystem. So um, because the other sysplex, sysplex members can very easily take over if something happens. So um, through this capability, we can enable continuous availability because let's say this this LPAR will just go out, it's no problem because through the cu coupling facility, we actually can take over right away. The coupling facility knows what's going on. There's like no, no downtime and, and no data lost. So um, if, you know, if, if during the time, you know, if you, if you, for example, do any sort of also planned upgrades or sort of planned works also that comes in handy because you don't need to worry that much of you know what happens if there are any sort of problems and so on so really this allows you to switch the entire physical machines without um you know without having any sort of problem without uh, the suspects ever going down mm -hmm. okay and then um i also want to talk a bit about scalability um so I said earlier that when an organization is buying a mainframe, they're able to configure it. Um, they would be able to say how many cores they wanna have, how many drawers they wanna have, how much IO, and based on that, they get delivered a mainframe. But you know, capacity demands can really vary. 
So they don't always stay the same. So, you know, they, they might vary dependent on what time of the year it is. Is it Christmas? Do people buy more with their credit cards or um, now with COVID do, you know, less cash payments, more car payments and so on. So capacity needs can be temporary and can change um, temporary. So um, therefore we have different offerings where, you know, organizations can temporarily add more capacity. Um, but there are also ways to add capacity permanently. So this can either happen to actually only activating cores, which are already in the system. So with every, every mainframe that gets delivered, you usually have some dark cores in there. So um, those could be um, activated remotely. Um, or you can also add um, you know, another CPC for if there really is a high growth demand. And you know, in comparison to you know, x86 server racks, you don't need to buy any additional hardware. You already have your hardware. You might, it might just need to be some code change, or you might need to put um, a, a new drawer into the frame. So um, you can really activate a lot remotely, which is quite cool. Um, OK, so now I want to take the, the, the next few minutes to look at a couple of use cases. So um, we know that mainframes are very powerful and that you can do a lot with you know, one single physical machine. And that really allows us to consolidate um, a lot of the x86 servers. So we can consolidate less powerful servers and run yeah, tens of, or hundreds of x86 servers on one mainframe. And um, you know this can reduce floor space because of course it's a smaller physical footprint. Um, but what is actually really cool is that um, you can reduce the energy consumption, which of course is very much in line with um, companies trying to um, become carbon neutral, become more sustainable. And if you're actually able to um, reduce your energy consumption in your data center, you can definitely also work towards reducing your carbon footprint. And data centers, we know, consume loads of energy. So this is actually a quite, quite big topic. Um, yeah, so now another um, use case I quickly want to touch on is blockchain. So mainframe is actually um, very well suited for um, pro projects around blockchain. I think that's something maybe not too well known, but um, in my job at IBM, I work with this topic quite extensively and I think it's really exciting um, because there are quite a lot of different blockchain use cases um, which are well suited for the platform. So you can run blockchain nodes on a mainframe. So you would, for example, have an LPAR and then you could just put a blockchain node in there. Um, you know, th there might be different reasons for why you want to run blockchain nodes on, on a mainframe, but one could be, for example, costs. You want to like really have an efficient solution. You might have loads of blockchain nodes and you want to put them all on, you know, on one system and, um, Actually, a mainframe might be the, the cheaper alternative to x86 servers, um, or it might be a security use case. So you might have um, you know, a, a quite sensitive blockchain node. So you maybe want to put it in a very secure environment. So you would put it in you know, a very isolated L part with maybe some added security features. So you can kind of assure that um, that node is safe. And then also, um, we have a very, a very good hardware security module in, in the mainframe. So that's the HSM, the Crypto Express cards. I, I quickly mentioned them earlier. Those will be the things which plug into the IO drawer. And um, you know, blockchain is a lot about um, encryption and actually keeping your private keys safe. And that's where you or a lot of organizations would like to use hardware security modules for. And that's also a very, very good fit with, with the mainframe. You can actually combine um, those sort of encryption tasks with maybe nodes running on, on, your, on um, your mainframe already. Okay, now um, the last thing I want to mention is security. Um, I mean, we, we know that we, we need a highly secure platform for this type of critical workloads like critical banking applications and all that but um you know we it, it's further like every industry every organization is having a huge focus on security um 
and it is such an important topic in the mainframe design that you know it like we keep on inventing and we keep on innovating to make it even more secure and to keep up with you know all of the things happening in that space so for example um a lot of investment went into quantum safe cryptography because you know if you have quantum computers and they try to kind of break your encryption you also need to think about how do you actually encrypt them so if we need to encrypt them in a quantum safe way or um stuff like fully homomorphic encryption which means that you can actually um do certain things like for example analytics or ai directly on encrypted data that's really exciting because you don't need to decrypt your data first you can actually um, do analytics on data which you know is uh, is secure because it's encrypted um or you know stuff like pervasive encryption which we also men mentioned earlier like really encrypting all of the data and um, not only encrypting certain parts so yeah i think there are really a lot of cool things for which we can use mainframes um just wanted to put in this slide um of the the open source ecosystem of things you can actually use on mainframes um you know because you really don't have like development on mainframe doesn't have to be special it doesn't have to be different it can feel quite cloud native um we have a lot of tools that are supported you can really kind of in in your normal ways of how you do things work with the mainframe and take advantage of you know the unique architecture that the mainframe has and the unique advantages like like the security like the reliability and like the availability um and yeah you can create all of your own cool use cases with that so um with that i'm at the end of my presentation just quickly want to show this chart which is for the gse conference charity raffle um so i think you can contribute here if you scan the qr code or on this link so um we are supporting different charities this year um for example the royal national lifeboat institution or the guide dogs for the blind so um if you enjoy gse maybe con <laughs> consider contributing and then here um the last slide which is just around session feedback so you can scan the qr code which will take you to that feedback form and we always appreciate any sort of feedback and how we can make those sessions better for you right you know thanks very much that was a really interesting presentation and i have allowed people to unmute themselves so if anybody does have a question or comment for lena then please feel free to unmute now Uh, we have something in, in the chat itself. Can you please share a link in the chat? Okay, is there is a link for the feedback you're looking for? I think, um, let me quickly. Yeah, I, I can get that and make sure I put that in the, in the chat as well. So, I mean, in the meantime, if there are any questions or feedback in terms of what you've heard today from Lena, then please feel free um, to unmute. So I just... Um send it in the chat the link to the feedback form oh, have you done that already yeah no. okay great thank you okay doesn't look like we've got any questions so well done i was very impressed um many of us have worked on the mainframe for many years and not really known what's happening under the covers so thank you so much for sharing that yeah, okay you. so for everybody else please do give your feedback we'd appreciate that and um, please do come back afterwards if you want to chat as well, directly contacting us. But other than that, have a good rest of the day and the rest of GSE. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.